Hey, a pleasant good day, everyone. This is the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Show. I'm Joe Boric, and I'm joined by the great John Duncan of Off the Wall Hockey, Payton of Payton on the Radio, and Pirlo of Pirlo Wisdom, and Steel Flyers Network. All of us are a part of. Please check that out on SteelFlyers.com. Let's get right into it as we're doing the Minnesota Wild. I'll go in the order that this is in on my screen. As always, we'll start with what are your first inklings when you think of this team? And I'll start with Peyton on that. We'll go with two thoughts. What are your first preliminary two thoughts just when you think of the Minnesota Wild this season? Uh, mediocrity. I guess I could. the best way I could put this team is just a, a team that's been there um, kind of out of a playoff spot for most of its uh, lifetime. And we have seen a lot of good players come in and out of that organization and a lot of players that just never turned out to be good there in Minnesota. Um, uh, that, that, those are the two first things that come to my head. And I guess we're, I guess we're f- finally starting to see some sort of rev- uh, resemblance of a team and uh, I guess a rebuild uh, as they brought in Marco Rossi this year, which a lot of people are really excited about. And I've seen a little bit in the World Juniors there playing for Austria and uh, just says one thing, mediocrity is the best way I could think of the Minnesota Wild. Yeah, uh, that's a way to put it. They're probably in the middle. They're in a division that uh, we'll have to see where they can go in there, but they're definitely probably, that's not a bad word to use. Uh, John, I'll go to you next. What are your initial thoughts when you think of the uh, Minnesota Wild this season? Uh, weird off season and middle of the pack they're just like i feel like we've said the same thing about the minnesota wild for the last like 15 years but they're just always middle of the pack they might sneak (laughs) into a playoff spot they might miss if they do make the playoffs they're out in the first round every single time it's the same thing over and over with minnesota they're not bad enough to get high draft picks but they're not good enough to be legitimate contenders and they're just stuck in the middle of the pack and Looking at what they did this offseason, I thought it was kind of just a weird offseason for them. Um, and it seems like they're going to be right in the middle of the pack as far as the NHL goes again this year. Uh, they made some moves that were kind of head scratchers, like that Marcus Johansson move. Um, getting rid of Eric Stahl and then bringing in Johansson, I don't really understand what the point of that was. Um, they brought in a veteran guy like Benino, but then on the other side of things, you know, they brought Rossi, they brought in uh, Kaprizov coming over from the KHL now. So they're like trying to get younger, but trying to stay relevant at the same time. And it just leads to them being right in the middle of the pack. Yeah, they also brought in uh, Bukestad, who's a guy that has been more of a bottom six guy that at one time people thought had a little bit more spark in his step. So maybe he'll show something there in uh, Minnesota and then Rask last year, which because of bringing in Benino and Bukestad, a question we'll get into later is if Johansson, who you brought up, will be a winger or center. But first I'll go to uh, Steve, a.k.a. Pirlo. What is your wisdom on the Minnesota Wild coming into this season? Uh, I'm I'm with John for sure. They're definitely a middle of the pack team. However, I think after it's been a while looking at some of the moves they've made and everything, I think he's going. He's looking to rebuild. Um, I think he's going through at least a retool. He's got so many guys. He picked up uh, guys that were on going to be UFAs like Marcus Johansson. They can all be flipped at the trade deadline. Nick Benino's very handy. Come for playoff teams. And stuff like that. It seems to mm-hmm. me like he's setting himself up to get draft picks. Uh, Bill Guerin, that is, when I say he. And uh, I think Bill Guerin's a smart hockey mind. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, even Nick Bukestad. He brought him over because it's hometown. And he's got basically an opportunity to turn around his career. If he does show that, they can keep him. If not, Somebody will want a big guy for the wing or something like that, and they can pick up a fifth for him or something like that. That's what it looks like to me. It looks like his main goal in this for this year is, ah, if we're in the playoff pitcher, okay, but really, I'm, it look, to me, it looks like he's leaning to, to move about all these pieces and, and really redo this whole team. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I think retool, rebuild is definitely a word. I think I would more use retool just because when you have veterans with those popping contracts still on a roster, usually the word retool is used more than a rebuild until you could potentially 
lift the contracts of Parise, Zuccarello, and uh, potentially even Sutter and Spurgeon off of your books, which would then make you be into a full rebuild. And I don't see that happening anytime in the near future for Minnesota. So, but I would say the next question we'll move on to is exactly what I hinted at, which is for you guys, for their best keys to success, even though they're not the deepest at center, Erickson Eck would really have to step up if this is the case, since Benino would probably have to be 2C. Uh, would you put Johansson on the wing, or would you put him at center to put out what you think would be the better game-changing lineup for what the Minnesota Wild would have this year? And this one, I'll start with John Olf. I mean, I want to see Marcus Johansson at wing. I've I've never seen anything I've liked from him at center. Teams have tried to make him a center, and he's not a center at the NHL level. He, all of his best years came when he was playing the wing. When he came up with Washington and was really good as a young player, he was playing the left wing. Well, even uh, in the playoffs a couple years ago, when he played with the Bruins after getting traded at the deadline, he had a really solid playoff. He was playing the wing with Charlie Coyle in the middle. Marcus Johansson is much, much better on the wing than down the middle. And if the Wild are going to be a playoff team this year, they need Marcus Johansson playing well, which he does on the wing, not at center. Yeah, that's definitely a very good point. Uh, Steve, I'll let you go next on this one. What are your thoughts, uh, your pearls of wisdom on Marcus Johansson? Well, it's simple. This is a, it's a double-edged sword here. Minnesota may have to play him at center because they. It depends on what uh, Eck can. Uh, you know, Benino's not a top three or top two, I should say. So they really don't have a top two center. And Johansson can bring some offense from the center position, but honestly, if he's in your center position, then you have no centers. So uh, I would have to put him on, like Buffalo, for instance, played him second line center and uh, kept on ro- trying to roll with that. Uh, he's just terrible. I mean, I, how do I explain? He's not terrible as a center in the sense that um, he's not terrible as a center as he's prob- he can play center, but you really, really, really want him to play on wing. He's way, 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 way better as a winger. Like, I can't even... He can be a 25-goal scorer on the wing. As a center, he almost plays the center position like he's a winger. (laughs) And that's really why. Like, you really got to be desperate to put him in center. Uh, I don't know why they keep on doing it. I don't know why. Teams have tried it over and over and over again, like John said. Uh, You think by now they would have figured out that he's not a center. So that's what I got to say about that. If you're playing him at center, you're in trouble. Yeah, I think uh, putting it in the way of you probably don't have the best centers if you're going to have to put Johansson at center when numbers just show he's strikingly better at wing. Um, I think it's going to heavily depend on how the veterans they brought in can do to potentially play your second line if Eriksson Ek is able to play your first. But what are your thoughts on Johansson, Peyton? Uh, I think... Johansson, I don't think he's a centerman. His numbers as a centerman are not very good, especially face-offs. Um, they're not very good. Now, you do have some center depth. Uh, with Eric Sinek, you could possibly use him up on the top six. But, I mean, we're talking about top six centermen. They really don't got that, nor do they got really top six wingers. Um, Marcus Johansson is not what he used to be. Um and same with some of the other players on this team, right? The only two guys that you could really say that are top six guys is Fiala and Parise. So Johansson, I feel, will most likely play on the wing. You might see a combination of Bukestad, Benino, Eriksson, Rask, and you, and then also you might see Nico Storm um, slotting up and down that center core as well. Um, you definitely will probably see a lot of younger centermen taking uh, a step into that roster. And even in the training camp right now, they got uh, Marco Rossi, Mason Shaw uh, as well there. Mason Shaw, a 22-year-old prospect there from Minnesota from the fourth round, uh, might even be somebody that they might even try to implement into the lineup as well um, for their center court because they they definitely don't got a lot of centermen on this team. They traded away their big one in Eric Stahl. Um, but I do see Johansson playing on the wing. He plays better on the wing. And if he's playing alongside of a goal scorer, for example, like Kevin Fiala, I'd rather have Johansson playing on the wing, setting up 
Fiala or Benino, whoever he's playing with. Yeah, that's a very good point. We also have to remember they got a Kaprizov uh, from the mm-hmm. K. So if you have him, he's going to be able to set up guys like Johansson significantly better if he's on the wing on the second line. I would say he'll start off on rather than being in center and playing. Like Pirlo said, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, more like a winger at center, which is mm-hmm. sometimes what happens when a guy's more used to one position and you kind of shove a circular cylinder into a square peg and put him at a different spot. Uh, so that's usually sometimes the result you tend to get from that. But as we look at this team, um, their goaltending this year, they of course went out and got Cam Talbot uh, early. Uh, really early in the free agent uh, market and made it clear that he was the guy they wanted at goaltender uh, with Alex Delock and uh, Kapo Kakinen that they still have uh, in-house. There's the three coming into this year. What do you guys uh, feel about the goaltender room in Minnesota with kind of three guys that at this point, nobody knows if they're full blown starters, but you might at least in Staylock and Talbot, have know that they're backups. What do you think of the potential for uh, their goaltender room? And I'll start with Peyton on this one. Um, I really like, uh, as an old Oilers fan, I really like Cam Tell, but I think with Capo Kakinen, who is a very highly touted prospect there for the Minnesota Wild as a goalie, uh, didn't too bad, uh, didn't do too bad there down in the AHL uh, with a 9.27 save percentage. Um, Cam Talbot has done great before. Now, yes, he is 33 years old and only played a limited amount of games for the Calgary Flames this year. But when he did, he played really well. And when he was in the playoffs there for the Calgary Flames as well, he was standing on his head in some of the games that I was watching. Uh, Calgary left him out the dry at some moments in time. And now he's coming to a team in Minnesota where their defensive core is loaded. I think Minnesota's best quality is their defense. And uh, Cam Talbot is going to a very good team defensively. Cam Talbot had a, uh, had some great years there in Edmonton. He was played a little too much and probably lowered his years uh, of playing in the NHL uh, since he played almost, with played almost yeah. a full 73 games. But I think if you play smart with Cam Talbot and you split the time between Cam Talbot and Capo Kakinen, or if you play Staylock, it looks like he's sort of injured right now. Uh, I'm not mm-hmm. too sure on that one, though, but... If they do play Capo Cock and alongside of Cam Talbot, I don't think it'll be a bad idea because Cam Talbot's been through a lot of crap the last couple seasons, dealing with all the Oilers uh, and, and then kind of bouncing around the league there. He's going to bring a lot of experience to that back end, which the Minnesota Wild need. They haven't had that kind of stability back there since, what, like Backstrom was in the back end and Devin, uh, Devin Doomnick. Um, was Doomnick, the- yeah the biggest guy until he kind of fell apart last year. Um, so not bringing in a young guy like Capo Kakinen who could be there for a pretty good amount of time there in Minnesota and bringing him an experienced guy like Cam Talbot, who, who does put up some pretty good, decent numbers and might be a deciding point for the Minnesota Wild on whether they make it or not. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. He's been around the block, and when you have a goalie, that's been around the block as that experience. You definitely want to bring him in when you have a younger guy like Cockin and you're trying to develop. And of course they also drafted in the second round in 19 Hunter Jones, who's a good young goalie in himself at 20 years old. So they got two guys in there to be potential future goaltenders for them. But uh, John, what are your thoughts on their goaltender room and uh, Talbot and Cockin and stay Uh Like almost everything with Min- the Minnesota wild middle of the road. I mean, when you look at mm-hmm. what their goaltending tandem is probably going to look like this year, it's it's not terrible, um, but it's not it's not one of the best ones in the league or anything like that. I mean, I, talking to Peyton and Perlo over the past few months have certainly made me like Cam Talbot a little bit more. And he did have a really solid year for the Calgary Flames last year after uh, a not so great end to his Edmonton tenure. But um you know, Talbot, Talbot, I think, can be a solid guy in a tandem, but I don't think he's a full-blown carry-the-team type starter, which Edmonton tried to make him into, and he just wasn't. Um, and, you know, Stalock, uh, from what I've heard, I don't believe is is in camp yet. He's injured, which 
They have obviously the young guy in, in uh, Kockinen, and they also brought in Andrew Hammond as kind of a organizational the depth guy because <laughs> they're not sure what's <laughs> what's up with Staylock yet. Staylock actually played in the playoffs for them last year in that qualifying yeah. round, and he Thank played pretty play well. Um, Dubnik just completely fell apart last year. Yeah, I know he had a lot of personal things going on, which probably didn't help, especially from a mental standpoint. But he completely fell apart last season, and that's, I think, why they moved on from him. It, it's a it's a middle of the road goalie tandem. It's it's not terrible, but you know you, you don't have a full blown starter there. I don't think, and you don't really have a guy that you can trust to go out and steal games on a nightly basis. You don't have a you don't have a top ten starter there, so. Um, it, it pretty much in line with the wild. It's pretty middle middle of the pack. Yeah, yeah. You definitely don't have a full blown uh, eye popping starter. I do think uh, because of some of what both of y'all said so far, their defensive scheme with the way that they try to protect their goalie. I think they're probably do pretty well. And Talbot's been shown obviously with Calgary, like you pointed out, John, at times last year when he came in since Riddich was having a down year to to uh, show up in lesser play when he's platooning and steal some games for you. But in a full starter capacity, he tends to sometimes wear out over time and then he won't be able to do that to as keen of a success as you get towards the back end of the season. That's why I think Cockadin, especially with Staylock being banged up, like you guys pointed out, is going to be a huge asset for them to be able to step in and play probably around the same amount of games. I only see like a five to 10 game difference potentially in this goalie tandem if all goes well for them, because I think they're going to want Talbot to be the veteran starter in the playoffs, but as rested as possible. But uh, Steve, what do you think of, of on their goaltender? Um, I think it's, like I said, it's a perfect goaltender for if you're think leaning rebuild, because if you are leaning rebuild, Talbot's good enough that he's going to be able to help your team play a good defensive system and kind of rely on the fact that he'll get the, he'll get the shots that he should, you know, that's the thing. He's, he's not going to generally now, uh, he hasn't really shown to get like, um, to be able to shut it right down. He hasn't been a complete shutdown goaltender. I like the way John says the middle of the road, something like that, like Minnesota has always been. And, um, uh, again, Parise almost went to the Islanders last year. They were going to get Ladd, and I can't remember what it was, but basically they were kind of getting Ladd, hoping he goes on the IR. And that screams like a general manager that's leaning rebuild to me. Mm -hmm. So if he does go lights out, and I'm rooting for Talbot too because I'm an Edmonton Oilers fan and I saw him play, uh, he – he was way over. He was way overplayed. Um, wasn't given the opportunity to grow. If he was, I think he'd be a lot better now than he would. But if he happens to be a late blooming goaltender and he's still thinking rebuild, you can get some draft picks for him too, right? So, to me, it's a perfect pick for a rebuild goaltender. Hopefully, to get them out of this middle of the road stuff they've been doing for 50 it's been frustrating to watch these guys pick in the middle of the draft barely make the playoffs losing the first round repeat you know same thing over and over again so it's either one or the other either you got to buy free agents and become good for a year or two or rebuild and i think it looks like to me garen is looking rebuild and i think talbot's a good goaltender for that because even in a rebuild you got to have a solid goaltender. How do you teach a defensive system to young guys if you can't trust your goaltender, at least, you know, if an average goaltender back there? Otherwise, they're going to play too tentative and they won't be able to instill a system they probably want to. So I think it's good. I think it's a good, good pickup. I agree with that. I think uh, for anybody in a three million range of a goaltender, if you do step up, yeah, you definitely are able to trade them for assets. Um, once you get in the, the four fives and up, uh, that's when teams start, I think, kind of scratching their head a little bit more before they acquire somebody. But the rebuild, rebuild is a word that, or retool is a word that's great to use because you got Kaprizov coming over. You got Rossi. Uh, you got Shaw that Peyton mentioned in camp. Kalen Addison, who is now their, arguably their best, is their best defense prospect probably, unless if you make O'Rourke that, who they just drafted, that they got from the Pittsburgh trade. 
that is going to work out better for them than Pittsburgh. Um, so because they also have this year's first or next year's first, depending what happens. So I do agree with you, uh, Pirlo. I think Billy Garen is setting them up in tip shop, tip top shape, excuse me, for a rebuild to be able to get going because they already have good guys in place. Uh, there's also another guy that they picked 86th in 2008, uh, Alex. Kovanoff, I wrote him down. I always pronounce his name wrong, but he seems like he's developing well. And then, obviously, Boldy had a good World Juniors. He actually surprised people how um, present he seemed initially on the ice in the World Juniors. And uh, I saw Twitter going, and Wild fans were complimenting analysts, saying, thanks, yeah, we're really excited about Matthew Boldy and all that. So I think they're moving in the right direction. It's just going to be about a three- to five-year period before you see the Wild probably at hitting it with all these guys coming into their core. Would you guys agree with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think three- to five-year I, I think so. Like the the Marit uh, Kusadonov there for the team Russia who played there as well in that World Juniors looked great as well. He's a small little centerman for the team and Baldy and they're really building up that that center core for the team, which you really need to. Minnesota, I think we could all agree on this that Minnesota's always had a problem with centers. They've never been able yes. to get that number one centerman. <laughs> Even a second line centerman, right? They, their best centerman was Granlin for the longest time, and then they traded him away for Fiala. Um, so they they haven't had the best center core in a long time, and getting Rossi now and having the amount of prospects you do have for that center core is going to help this team out a lot for to help that rebuild go a lot quicker when you already have Fiala and you already have Kaprizov up on the, uh, up on the main roster. Once you get Rossi and a lot of those guys developing on the main roster, Minnesota will be a, a very scary looking team to look at. Yeah, this is a team, uh, John, I go to you on this one, but I think with the way they're set up, they could with the veterans they added still be scrappy, especially the division they're in and maybe be near the playoffs or make them in years, but just, about probably three years or so before these guys are up and they're really hitting it. Is that what you would think? Maybe there'd be that scrappy middle of the pack team, like you said, that could be competitive, but been about three years or so, these guys will be hitting their prime years and really maybe coming into their own. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Kaprizov's just put back to back 30 goal seasons in the KHL up. So I think, you know, getting him to come over, that's a big scoring addition to this team. Um, and obviously you've got R Rossi is your centerpiece to build around now, which I think getting Marco Rossi in this year's draft was probably as good of a thing that could happen to the Minnesota wild as there is. Cause he is your center to build around now. I think he's going to be a legit number one star center in the league. And if you can put some scores around him, look out. Cause we saw what he did in the OHL with, with you know, passing the puck and putting up such a ridiculous number of assists so yeah ha you have like 80 assists last year like if you can put scores on his wings 81, assists. 81 <laughs> assists last year like if you can put scores on his wings you are going to have a team that can score goals and they've got fiala which that trade looks better and better every day for the minnesota wild you've got kaprizov coming over and matthew boldy is a guy that I want to touch on because I get to see him on a pretty regular basis because he plays at Boston College. The shot on this kid is sick, but he can rip the puck. So Matthew Boldy's a guy that I think could, you know, he's not NHL ready yet. I think he's still a few years before you're going to see him at the NHL level. But when he's ready and, and ready to take that step into an NHL lineup, you're going to see a guy that probably scores 25 goals in his rookie season. And a guy that's going to put the puck in the net on a consistent basis because he can score with anybody at the college hockey level. And I, it's only a matter of time, I think, before that translates to the NHL. So uh, they've got some good prospects. And if they keep, you know, as long as they commit to this retool and keep on the track that they're going, I mean, you're, three to five years from now, we could see a Minnesota Wild team that's more dangerous than any Wild team we've seen in recent history. Yeah, they've been scouting really well. They also picked up um, Brendan McNeil, the undrafted defenseman that they, I think he's in camp, uh, but they 
picked up. They're they're really going full throttle here with getting guys below the draft. Uh, the young defense or center, excuse me, Payne, you mentioned uh, Marit Kusadinov was 37th overall. So they pick him top 15 and bottom tier into the second round and also later rounds well, which is uh, 109th overall is where they found their potential future goaltender in Kakanen or second round in Hunter Jones, depending which one of those emerged. So I think Lately, what I've seen with Minnesota is they're scouting, especially since Billy Garen has come in and they've went to this retool mode. And then now it seems like rebuild has really gotten on point in the last few years. And they've really been since maybe 17, 16, drafting better. And that's what's been building this good foundation below. And it, that's really nice for them because I want to see a team hockey town like Minnesota um, a team that's a middle market team that doesn't have the best chance to get success spending to find a way to get success other ways. And it seems like that's going to happen because of their young guns. But what do you think about some of the young guns, Pirlo? Well, I love Kuzn enough. I had him in the first round. And uh, when they, like, I thought they did fantastic with the draft. The difficult thing is going to be, even if they do work out, they are going to be small up the middle now. But at least they have... Lots of talent up the middle, assuming, assuming Kuznudinov is going to be able to translate his game into the North American game because he is on the light side. But hands, oh, the <laughs> kid had hands in junior. And uh, Boldy, I know uh, I, I really paid attention to it because John, John talked a lot about Boldy before we uh, – because uh, he he's does live games. Check him out, by the way. <laughs> live college games. Uh, and I was listening to him, and he talked highly of Boldy, which is isn't a isn't a thing that you wouldn't expect since he was a first round pick. But he does he remind you of uh, Palmieri a tad? Like he kind of gives me that Palmieri, like he can go to the net hard shot type thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like a better like just thinking of Boston, like a better version of Craig Smith, but like just such a consistent yeah. kid coming out of college who's going to give you consistent scoring. Yeah. So yeah, I, uh, this draft in particular, we're O'Rourke. I mean, I saw guys. There's some guys <laughs> from the hockey, the hockey buzz, buzz group who I do have a lot of respect for. Although um, it, that had him like in the top 15, O'Rourke, and uh, they're usually pretty good when it comes to drafting. So uh, they, I thought they did well. I thought they did really well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for O'Rourke, I'll say, I think the reason, because I listen to that hockey buzzcast when I can as well, he was considered potentially when you develop, he might not, he has a booming slap shot, but a great two-way developing defenseman yeah. where some of the other guys were pick your one side. It was like mm -hmm. you were getting more of a guy that was going to be steady Eddie, like a Lindgren potentially uh, on the defensive end, or you were going to get your guy that was more like a Tony D'Angelo offensive minded guy or drew dowdy so it was more if you wanted to get maybe a guy you could develop into your best of both worlds mm -hmm. ryan warwick was probably one of the guys uh to go with for that yeah. but as we're wrapping up this video i'm just going to ask everybody in this western division that is definitely one of the easier going to be a fun one to watch but one of the team the divisions with a lot of middle of the road teams in it uh, where do you think the Minnesota Wild are going to shake out? Uh, and this is probably not an easy question because of this division. I'll start with John on this one. I, I honestly, looking at that division has your clear top three. And then after that, it's kind of a crapshoot. I'm going to say fourth. I honestly think Minnesota, even with this team, gets in the playoffs and finishes fourth. Just be, I, I still, LA could very well take that spot. And if San Jose, if their older guys get back on track, could very well take that spot. And, and but I, Nick bounces back. Yeah, but I, I feel like it's a complete crapshoot between those three teams for the fourth for the fourth spot. And I'll, I'll say, I'll give it to Minnesota. I'll say that they make the playoffs at number four, L.A. just outside, San Jose just outside, and then you know, I think Anaheim probably finishes last. But um, that division, like it, it's just clear-cut Colorado, St. Louis, and Vegas at the top. And then after that, it's a large gap from – those three down to the rest of that division. 
Yeah, I agree with that. It is the top three, and then you kind of have whoever falls into four there. Uh, Steve, I'll let you go next on this one. Where do you think they're going to fall out at the end of the season? Uh, are they going to be in or are they going to be out the Minnesota Wild? Um, I was leaning fourth, but actually I think I'm going to go – I think they're just going to – I'm going to take L.A. to be fourth in that simply because I just think L.A. is more motivated for winning. I think I think – Minnesota players may put two and two together and realize that this looks like a structure of a rebuild quite a bit. And uh, I think the heart of what Garen is doing is a rebuild. And eventually through the season, it'll come into realization that that's what's happening and Minnesota will fall off. The difficult thing is I really like the way Everson had them roll in there. And if he can get them going like he was at the end of the year last end of the regular season last year. Now, then I'll probably flip it and say, but I agree with John where it's kind of LA, Minnesota. And then I get a big gap after that. Arizona, freaking forget about it. They don't even yeah. want to be up there. Like those guys aren't even close. So no. yeah, I agree. It's somewhere one of those two, but I'm going to take, I'm going to say LA gets in because I, I just love Lardy there in LA. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely after the top three, like you said, a crapshoot. But yeah, I could see LA. You made a good point because they're towards more towards the end of the retool, rebuild. So they're starting to see in the next one to two years, going to see progress where the Wild are more towards the forefront of theirs. So that does definitely make some sense there. Uh, Peyton, where would you put them in this season round and out? Um, I think I'll place them in the same spot John did and fourth spot. Um, it's going to be a very tight mix between all those bottom feeder teams. Um, Perlo is staying in LA. I think San Jose could possibly have a little bit of a bounce back season. If of course they stay healthy, there's a lot of big questions with them. There's a lot of big questions with LA and Arizona and Anaheim. Minnesota is one of the clearer ones to me on this list. You got a lot of good potentially good players if Fiala has another good season if Prize has another good season and stays healthy and if the defense core plays great you could possibly see this team in fourth place probably not a spot Bill Guerin wants to be in um I mean every GM would love to be in that spot in the playoff spot but they most likely do either want to retool or rebuild from what they're showing with just signing all these or getting all these players to have one-year deals, um, expiring contracts. Now, either they want to build up next year in free agency or they want to build it up with young players. But I do see Minnesota getting into that fourth spot and uh, making it into the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely, I think you guys hit it on the head. They're either right on the outside or likely the fourth team, just with how this division shaked out. Um, for me, I'm going to put them just on the outside because just from paying attention, I pay attention to the California teams a lot for the one side I work for. I feel like LA, what Pirlo was saying is kind of what I was thinking. Uh, Steve, a.k.a. Pirlo down there, as you see his name. Um, I just think they're more towards the – if their young guys get cruising, they know they're right at the – we're about to hit it and start building the new core of L.A. period where uh, Minnesota, like Steve said, if they start showing any signs of weakness, know they're more in a rebuild mode, that might play into your psyche a little bit. And that's why I feel that L.A. might have a little bit better with guys coming up during the course of the year that are cracking right on the door compared to more 19- and 20-year-olds that are about a year or two away in Minnesota. I think that might propel them to be fifth and L.A. to be fourth. But I could see them being fourth, and if that happens, I think it would be because Cam Talbot comes in, as we said in this video, plays well with their defense. And their defense is really what carries them, like we touched on some of this video, with guys like Kaprizov and Fiala continuing to perform on offense. But I just see L.A.'s young gun stepping up more, and even uh, Byfield, when he eventually probably gets a chance this year, uh, playing an impact there. And then you also have Turcotte as a youngster in L.A. that people think 
is a, a little bit more as a 19, 20 year old ready to make the jump if you want him to than some guys that are 19 and 20 and mini. So that's just the way that I look at that there. But either way, we have them either in or right on the outside uh, looking in. So you're definitely going to have an exciting to the end season, it sounds like, Minnesota Wild fans from what we're giving you. This has been the uh, Sports for Ag News NHL team preview to the Minnesota Wild for John from Off the Wall Hockey, Peyton from Peyton on the Radio, and Steve KK Pirlo from Pirlo Wisdom YouTube, and all of us from the Steel Flyers Network. Check out steelflyers.com. I'm Joe Boric. Have a great, safe, and pleasant day, everyone. Peace out.